Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back my good friend Kathy Graff. Of course, you know she is the widow of David Graff, who played Tackleberry in the Police Academy movies. I'm having her back on today. We are just going to have a random chat maybe comment on the pandemic and all the horrible, horrible stuff that's going on in the world today. I haven't talked to Kathy uh, since I think it was late May of last year was the last time we talked and I can't wait to have her back on today. She's a great lady, just a wonderful lady and she's very passionate about causes and all that. And she's very talent. She's a very talented writer. And it's going to be great to have her back on. So, yeah, here is my new interview with Kathy Graff. Hi, Tommy. Hey, Kathy. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm, if I sound cheerful, I'm kind of faking it. Uh, I got this email from a um, guest of mine that cut me like a knife just a little while ago. Oh, no. Yeah, I'd asked her to uh, record a plug for my show, and she, just, she said, I'm not into that. And it's just like, what's that mean? You're not supportive of my show, you know? Yes, well, you know, the, uh, this business is full of a lot of great people, and it's also full of a lot of wild and crazy people, too, you know? Yeah, and, uh, a lot of crazy so people. Just let it go, you know? It's, I don't know. So she won't do it for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell me, how's it going in your show, though, other than that? Is it, has it been doing well? You doing it? This has been the most fantastic year I've had in the last three years. I mean, there is. I, I mean, last year was a pretty good year, but this year is has been even better. I mean, I've had people that I've been trying to get since I first started that I wasn't able to, and I didn't even think I would. And people I would never dream of interviewing. I've interviewed two people who died like two weeks later. Oh wow! I mean. Oh. I mean, just legends, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm happy for you. <clears throat> well, what, are you seeing, what are you seeing as the trend and what people are talking about now with the COVID and everything? I mean, the art, you know, the, the art world has suffered greatly. Oh, yeah. That's what I keep hearing constantly. Um, you know, production shutting down, uh, theaters closing, just yeah. lots of stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really sad. And I, I, for one, you know, of course, I decided to change my life by moving here. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a incredibly strange and adventurous time here, um, as you can imagine. But um, um, it also is, as I just can't even imagine that the theaters are going to be, you know, the theater stays there. They usually like to do plays that are, you know, what's current, what are the, what's the current issues of the day. And the current issues of the day going forward are going to be what happened during isolation and COVID for people. Mm -hmm. And two, you know, what we're protesting, what I went on a protest about yesterday, Black Lives Matter. And um, so I think that there's probably not going to be that much room for me anymore. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out that, you know, like I have plays on unfinished and I have plays that were supposed to be getting done and I'm just looking at it going you know I may you know change course so I've already thought about that before but now it's becoming sort of pretty obvious really I mean it, I mean I could still happen I could probably possibly write a book or just um, find a different avenue that makes me happy find something else you know so mm -hmm. I don't know and I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are having to reevaluate um, their plans and their lives right now um, well, in New York world. I'm talking specifically, even though it, obviously that is about everybody in the world, in every business pretty much. 
um, yeah. you know, like small restaurant owners and stuff. I mean, you just feel so sorry for everybody. But in the art world, I mean, I can't imagine like the smaller theaters in LA even staying afloat after this, frankly. I mean, I imagine they're still playing rent, paying rent and getting no income. I, I just, I just don't know how they're doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, pretty wild. It really is. It so is. I, I don't know. The world is changing. Yeah. Well, don't give up, though. Be, uh, just, you know, let, let everything see, you know, what's going to yeah. happen first, you know, because you've put so much work into it. And yeah. I, I do not see myself changing my avenue because it's just it's all it's all I've wanted to do, you know, ever since I've recovered from my car accident. Well, that's good then. So you're on the you're on track, and you're young too, Tommy. So it's a lot of it is also just, you know, the way the world already looks at people like at a certain age and stuff like that too. I mean, I'm not blaming it. I'm not doing a sour grapes thing in any way, shape, or form. I'm just being realistic about things. Like, yeah. so I'm going to keep trying. Um, I, you know, I was in negotiations with a the theater in LA to have a play done. It's going to be the summer. So, you know, whether or not that theater even survives whether we can come to some sort of a of a way to put my play on, if my play is going to even seem the least bit relevant to them anymore, that sort of thing, because it was just a, a fun comedy with, with, a, with, a, with a real strong voice. But it was, uh, it has nothing to do with COVID and has nothing to do with, you know, being on the short end of uh, our society and uh, being black or brown, you know. So, yeah. I don't know, you know, I don't know. Um, anyway. <laughs> so that's all. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's I mean, I am thinking about, you know, uh, I hope it's okay that I'm just keep on talking, Tommy. I suppose that's kind of what you want, right? Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so, um, you know, I've been thinking, I, I was really interested in the history of New York, and I've been reading a lot about it, and sort of started that when I was back in L.A., and so I was excited to get here and really... You know, my whole idea is writing notes down of all the places I want to go look at and see and get inside and do. And, and of course, it's changing. I mean, I've been walking around here and looking at the architecture uh, without a lot of people on the streets and sidewalks. So that's been really cool because, you you know, you know you're not looking over a sea of people, which you usually are. There aren't any tourists. So I'm, like, seeing buildings clearly, you know. And that's what's been really neat. I've been really using it to my advantage mm -hmm. with uh, COVID stuff. Uh, but I, I am thinking, like, you know, it's, uh, one day I woke up and I went kind of like, you know, you are so interested in the history of New York. Well, girlfriend, you are in one of the most historic times in New York City ever. Yeah. So <laughs> that's pretty cool, right? I mean, right. that kind of changed things around. I mean, that's what I was depressed. Or I, you know, we all have our moments of depression through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of, I kind of went, wanted to look at it that way because there's something really interesting there. I just got here. You know, planned on doing this and that. Everything got turned around. A lot of people I know are in between two worlds right now. And it's very interesting to me. And also connecting the dots of this whole thing about I can't breathe. Um, I can't breathe from George Floyd, but it also has something to do with the fact that COVID is, is killing people by not, they can't breathe. And, and you know, also we're also stifled. And we're in these masks that we can't breathe. It's like, wow, the whole, like, planet, the whole Certainly our country is like, we're all just like angry and exhausted because we can't breathe properly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have no, you know, no real federal leadership, like at all. So it's really, it's really an interesting, crucial, and I don't think the, the whole bad stuff is over yet. I think it's going to, you know, it's like we almost had to crumble the whole damn thing to the ground. I mean, it's just like everything, everything crumbling in a weird way, and now starting to hopefully rebuild. I went on a march yesterday, and it was huge, huge. Mm -hmm. I went out, I, you know, it's all like younger people, so I was one of the few older people, and I'm walking, and I get to Columbus Circle, and that's about 20, 25 uh, blocks from me, and they walk all the way to City Hall in Manhattan, and I'm like, oh, shit, I don't know if I can, I mean, I walk a lot, but that was a lot. Yeah. And once I get down there, they're going to continue probably going over the bridge. I don't know, but I went, uh, you know, I got to now figure out how I'm going to get home because I haven't even been doing public transportation. I haven't done cabs. I've just been walking. And that's, I, and I was <laughs> at that time because not only are you <laughs> walking, but you're in a group dynamic. You're, you're chanting the whole time. You know, you're, it's, it's, it's hot. And, and so I got to about 25th 
street and I said, guess what? You're going to get in the cab for the first time since COVID. And I did. And uh, it was fine. But, oh, my gosh. But anyway, my point was is that yeah. these people that were running this, these Black Lives Matter uh, leaders, uh, I, I assume they're all sort of trained together because the, it was so cohesive and so consistent. And I was so impressed with what they talked about, what they were telling us, what they were demanding, or, or at least trying to get people to be aware of. They don't, you know, they don't want the, the little band aids being put on again. They want, they want major change. They're looking for, they want executives. They want black executives. They don't want just, you know, Nike to send out a nice thing, which they did. But they want. They want to see people get into executive positions. They want to see owners in sports. They want to see more coaches. You know, it's just like it was really consistent. And everybody that took that mic um, was so well spoken and eloquent. And it was just it was really a beautiful thing to watch, you know. It was, it was just awesome, really. And, and, and I'm learning because I, I didn't, I mean, I mean, I knew some of it. I have black friends. I have jobs, you know. But I've never... Like a lot of people here are, are, are waking up to the fact that this is like something they worry about. Um, they're talking about I, something in the New York Times is about, you know, everybody's taking car trips because that's a really healthy way to sort of like avoid people and stuff, except for the fact that black people aren't comfortable in cars. And they're not going to drive uh, through different states because they're, they, they never know who they're going to meet. You know, they, yeah. they're, they're so afraid of the racist cop. And it's like, wow, I never thought of that. I mean, they don't even feel like they could escape for a while, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is something I've never had to think about in my life. You know, I've, I've thought about it from a woman's point of view. Women have to, women are in the world differently than men. My son always goes, why don't you do this? I said, yeah, no, because I'm a single woman. I'm a woman walking by herself. There are certain things I do not do. I cannot go down certain roads. I have to be aware at all times of every little thing because men hurt women. Men, women don't hurt men, so men don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, you know, these are things that women have had to deal with in a different way. But, um, you know, imagine a black woman. I mean, my like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I just I just love this. I, I just hope this. I'm so proud of the generation of my children. I don't know how old you are, Tommy, but, they, you know, they're, um, they're in their late 20s. And their generation has just been geared up for this very moment. My son has always been. Um, a real advocate about prison reform, and he actually takes uh, children, um, or he used to, but they couldn't do it this year. He, mm-hmm. he, he, he takes a couple of children up to visit their mothers in a prison way up at the border of by Canada. Uh, he said, look, the kids live in the Bronx, you know, and mm-hmm. because they never get to see their mother but once a year. So he, he's been involved with this sort of thing and in, in the incarceration of so many black people, and and how it just, you know, it just perpetrates itself over and over and over again. And uh, and he, he always told so many things that I always thought were so, you know, a little, a little too extreme for me. You know, I, you know, what do you mean defund the police? What do you mean do, do this with the police? You can't have the police. And now I'm realizing, like, it's, it's a generational voice. They've been thinking this way for a long time. And I'm just catching up to the fact that they're right. Uh, you know, that, that, and it's kind of like, what blacks have been trying to tell us for a long time, and we haven't been paying enough attention. They're right. And it is a systemic change that has to be made. So it's really it's, it's really quite fascinating to me. Um, I'm a yep. student like everybody else, you know? Yeah. Wild, I think, you know? Yeah. How about you? Are you having... Um, I, I shouldn't have just assume that you're on my... I, I know you're on my team because I, I do... We are on social media together, you know? We yeah. like each other's stuff and all that stuff. I get it. But I, are you having, um, you know, protests and stuff by you? Are you ready? I think that's where you are, Reading, right? I'm in Reading, yeah. Um, over yeah. here... Yeah, we've we've had a very very low number of deaths from COVID. Um, it went oh, good. it went from only one to about seventy, and oh, wow. that's it's terrible for the families, but it's a good number, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know as far as the race thing. I don't know anything uh, about that over here. I haven't seen anything bad, you know, and stuff. We, I live in a mostly a town of white people, you know. Yeah. I don't yeah. see any much mixed um, ethnicity over here and stuff, but I feel really bad about what's going on and stuff. And um, I I have a friend out in L.A. who's half black and half white. She's been very 
Oh, so very upset about this. Every day on Twitter and Facebook, she's posting stuff, and well, I have never, se- I have, I have never seen her this upset before. You know, but uh, when you were talking about the uh, about the the black people driving thing, oh God, it reminds yeah. me of this hilarious story that happened to me uh, back in 2009. I was dating this black girl, and um, everything we everything we did. With the exception of our first date, we had to do with her children because uh, she didn't have anyone to watch her children. You know, um, her son was, I believe, two or three, and her um, daughter was, I think, ten or eleven, somewhere around there. And um, we went all the we drove all the way to Monterey this one day, and um, I remember. I said to her at some point, I was like, I wish your kids weren't in the back seat. This is a very politically incorrect thing. I, was, I, I wish that your that your kids weren't in the back seat because I would love for you to give me a hand job while you drive. <laughs> and she laughed and said, I'm going to give you a, a, a G-rated one. And I was like, wait, what's that? And she's like, oh, you'll see. And so then when we were driving... She took my hand. We were holding it. She was holding. We were holding uh, hands while she was driving the entire time. And she took my thumb and she started stroking it. <laughs> <laughs> and we were laughing. We were just laughing. And her daughter was in the back seat going, "Why are you two laughing?" <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that that relationship did not last very long. But um, I. Her and I remained contact for about, I don't know, about four or five years after until my accident happened. And then her number was in my old phone. And I remember I remember her maiden name, but she, I remember she got married about a year before my accident. So I, I couldn't even find her if I wanted to. But I hope she's doing all right, and I hope she's still married. <laughs> you, uh, you are sort of, uh, as far as Kobe, you say there's not much there in your area. Uh, no, I've, I've been very lucky, but I will tell you, uh, the first week of May last month, I was sick for about 72 hours. That was just, oh, it was dreadful. And I, and I was for damn sure I had it. And I went yeah. to my doctor and I got tested. Oh, that test sucks. I mean, they, they jammed that Q-tip all the way up your nose. It, I know, I had it done too. <laughs> yeah, and they, they, they leave it up there for way too long than they should and it's just the most uncomfortable feeling um i hope they eventually come up with a new way of doing it yeah but um i, w- I was tested negative and it was great you know and it only lasted yeah. the the, the, the um, I, I had some kind of a flu that lasted 72 hours thank god but it was yeah. pretty damn scary huh. interesting yeah no i had i was sick for a month in january and mm-hmm. I was sure I, that after it was over and COVID came out, I went, oh, I'm going to hide the antibodies, I'm sure. And uh, no, no, it was just a different flu. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no big deal. Look, it's, you know, it's, it's getting, I mean, it's much better here in New York now. I mean, you said to be on the streets. I mean, I, I know we are in danger of second wave because people are getting more casual about it uh, all over the country. But mm-hmm. uh, it's nice. That the you know in Columbus Avenue, for instance, close by me, the, the restaurants you know are open uh, you know to take out and stuff, and people congregate just a little bit, and I think people are by and large obeying rules. Um, but it's just this feeling of like, oh, the world's coming back again. You know, I remember how wonderful the city is. You know, and it's just been so shut down. It's, it's been kind of depressing, really. It's. I mean, there's less people on the so I keep saying, just enjoy that right now because, you know, at the height of it, I mean, the city is just a buzz at all times. And so I am, I am enjoying that. The park are is crowded. I mean, people are definitely trying to social distance. Most people are doing it, but then there are people that, you know, don't wear the masks and stuff. And then you get to a place like this, it's scary that way, you know. Yeah. Um, so you have to, I just have to be, you have to be overly cautious. I'm always on the alert, you know, just to you know, dodge people and whatnot. So it's not always wonderful. But, um, you know, I, as I said to myself, I'm wearing the mask, I said to myself, 
you know, it's worth it to be here and doing this thing, to be a part of the city. It's, I just, it's just, I'm so glad I, I, I moved when I did because um, I'd be stuck in LA now, and I was pretty much done with LA. So um, I'm glad I'm here. That's, it's a real adventure. I think I'm a kind of an adventurous person. And, yeah. um, I like I like exploring new things very much. So it's fun that way. I miss my son. He's still in LA. Uh, yeah. I, I just saw my other one. He was out in the Hamptons. Uh, he was uh, staying at his in-law's house, which is just amazingly gorgeous. So I went out for a week and, and visited, and now he's back in Brooklyn because his uh, his wife is a is a um, journalist, so she wanted to get back for you know all the protests and stuff. She felt it was her duty, which is good. So yeah. it's uh, it's it's interesting. It's, it's the world the world is you know it's, it's turning on its head. It's, it's just so interesting. You think and what, what's interesting? If you'll forgive me to be political again, but <laughs> it's okay. It's almost like we have this person at the helm. Supposedly, um, who is such such exactly the opposite of what I consider to be a good human being, mm-hmm. and, and yet, he, and yet the people, the changes that are going to be made are going to be some of the most progressive in the in the history of this world, in this country, and in spite of him, because he's on the other side, you know, he he believes in you know tear gassing um, um, protesters and whatnot, you know, oh. it's, 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 progress, the, the progression is going to be, I think, fierce and, and wonderful and sustainable, sustainable frankly. Um, and it's funny how it happened under this guy. It's just interesting to me. I don't, I need to have people that are smarter than me, more politically minded than me, teach me about it all, but it, there, there is obviously something to it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, that- anyway. I've never been to a protest. I would, I would like to and stuff, but I'm afraid because I can't run anymore, and I got metal in my leg from my accident. I just, yeah. I'm afraid something dangerous is going to happen. The closest I ever came though to going to a protest was um, back in like I want to say 2010 or 2011. I just happened to see this protest that was going on for gay rights in um, in my hometown of San Mateo, and people I knew were there, and. <laughs> I just, I couldn't believe it, you know, but I was like, I better get out of here before the shit really gets, da- goes down. And it didn't, as far as yeah. I know, but, uh, it was a, it was a small little protest, you know? Well, it should, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it, we went to one when I was in the Hamptons, then when I went over, I just went to one of a couple hundred people, mm-hmm. but it just feels good to be a part of, I just do it, you know, it's like, go give them your person to make the crowd bigger. I don't do signs generally or anything like that. I just show up and just so I can, you know, I feel good. I feel good about that. You know, I'm really worried about COVID stuff, I admit, but, you know, I feel good that I am, you know, a white woman that's going and saying, this is, this is where I will, this is, this, this is, these are the people I will, I want to see do all right. And just, I don't know, I just feel responsibility to them a little bit. So I never really did it in the 60s. I was a little bit young. Yeah. Well, that, but uh, since then, I've protested a lot. <laughs> since Donald Trump became president, I've been on a lot of protests. <laughs> yeah. Starting with the Women's March, you know, like right away. That was amazing. Um, it, makes me, it makes me feel good. I, I actually tear up when I'm on them because uh, people are chanting and everybody's just, it's just, it's a very powerful feeling. And it was like yesterday, and I was crying through a lot of it because it's just so, I, to me, it's beautiful. You know, it really is. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, that this has been humbling for a lot of people because, um, and I've said this many times over the last three months, that, um, you know, ever since 9-11 happened, we've been very, well, not us, but like just the, the, the world in general has just been very greedy and selfish and just yeah. mean-spirited. And I think um, that, you know, this is God's way of, of saying, go to your room and think about what you've done, you know? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I have a friend uh, who's Jewish. Her mother is a Holocaust survivor, and she's getting a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from this whole ordeal. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I can see that. Well, your, your friend that um, you said that's in L.A., that's mm-hmm. part black, um, why is she so upset by all this? Is she not buoyed a little bit by it? Does she not, does it not make her feel... Like things are are good though too. Like they're always. Are you talking about just specifically the George Floyd thing? The the 
the George Floyd thing specifically, yeah, yeah I, she's not a political person at all, really. But that's just it's it, it's making her really upset, and she's posting about it every moment and stuff, you know. Yeah. And I told her, yeah. I, I told her, I said, I, I support your stance on race a hundred and ten percent, but please don't become a social justice woke warrior because I just cannot stand those people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope um, this Black Lives Matter is a social uh, order, but it's just, I, I was just incredibly impressed with it. So, we'll see what happens next, you know? Yeah. Um, Broadway is not going to open until phase four, and that's like months and months, and that's if everything goes well with stage one, two, and three. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I, I can't imagine anybody before that um, vaccine comes around wanting to go and sit in a group of how much money you, you're, you're usually supposed to give them to uh, to perform uh, your show there, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can put on my play for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Oh, my God, $600, that's insane. It's insane. It's insane and wrong, in my opinion. Uh, Very wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of, the, yeah. one of the biggest things that I've... Uh, pretty uh, devastated about, and uh, hopefully it's good. It's it's going to uh, come back around next month. Everyone's like been talking about it and excited. Is uh, you know the conventions that I go to, the comic cons and the horror cons yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a bunch of them happening next month, and everyone is talking like they're going to go off without a hitch. You know, uh, one in particular um, in the Bay Area that I'm uh, planning on going to. Uh, they they said. They don't know if they're, if they're actually going to do it for sure because the city is uh, telling them, you know, they have all these tables six feet apart and all this stuff, you know. And they said, we we, we, we might wait until next year. We're not going to know it until beginning of July, and then we'll make the announcement because the con was supposed to be July 26th. So uh... I'm waiting to hear <clears throat> about that and stuff. I mean, if it is going to go off without a hitch... I'm going to have press badges, and me and a friend, we're going to go. And I, I really want to talk to the promoter because he's been a guest on this show, and I don't know if he'd remember me, but I like I want to host panels for him in the future. So I, I'm That's hoping. Great. Yeah, so it's going to be a big opportunity for me because uh, I had a chance to do it last year, but I didn't I didn't get a chance to talk to him. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, they sent me – I can't remember how someone got in touch with me, but somebody did it. I just – you're just reminding me that I forgot. Mm-hmm. And they asked me if I would be interested in appearing in, um, I think it was, um, you know, the Trekkie thing, you know, Star Trek, and I was on Deep Space Nine. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I, although I, I'm, I'm wondering if it wasn't the Police Academy stuff, like the, the, the comic one, um, I don't remember now, but I, said, I filled out the information that they wanted me to fill out, and I said, absolutely, let me know. This is, of course, before COVID. So I think what you're saying is, and they said, if it's not this year, it'll probably be next year, which means it might be two years from now <laughs> that I would be able to show up. But, but yeah, it's, uh, people tell me they're really fun. And, and this person says, you know, we pay your way and we put you up for the night. I'm thinking, well, yeah, I'll go. Man. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. I, mean, they, I don't know how they make that much money to be able to do that. They they had a um, oh you'd be surprised they had a um, a police academy reunion at the Hollywood show last year. Um, a Steve Gutenberg, Leslie Easterbrook, um, who else was there? A couple of people were there. It wasn't like a huge one, but uh, it was a nice um, it was a, it was a nice little one and stuff. And I was like, oh god, just I wish I could I, I wish I could have been able to go. I mean, just to mm. get a photo op with all those people, it would have been awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, I, I haven't heard from anybody 
that way for a while, but they are going to honor David at his high school. He's been inducted oh. into the high school Hall of Fame at his school in Lancaster, Ohio. Mm-hmm. So they asked him to put together, you know, all the stuff for that. And they're going to see if they're going to have it now, because that's supposed to be kind of like you're talking. That's supposed to be in October. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, they want me to do one. I was had to do that invite list and all this stuff, and it's a pretty big deal for them. I mean, not so much for me, to be honest with you, but, you know, I, I appreciate the honor, and I know David would, and, um, you know, I'll go if they have it, but not if I feel like it's, you know, going to cause me COVID. I'd probably just drive out there, um, maybe maybe even with my son. But, like, my other son in L.A. would love to have come, but I, you're not going to risk your life for this. This is not something you risk your life for here. You know, it's just the high school thing. You watch the football game and then they honor, you know, David. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see if that happens. Oh. It's not this year or next year, but it's not, it's very nice of them. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Is there uh, any word on the Police Academy documentary? You know, I, I mean, I never got, I never heard that from those guys, which was, I didn't hear once. They, they sent me something and said, hi, how you doing? Just thinking of you. And it was really nice. Mm-hmm. But, um, I never got a copy of it or heard anything about it. I didn't hear about this reunion that you were talking about. And I was probably there for that, but I wasn't invited to that. And often they will invite me, and I, I do like going. But anyway, so I don't know. I don't know about the documentary. And I understand there's pieces of that documentary in, in this new, they put out a new full set of the, the movies or something, and they showed it. Somebody said they were showing it. Uh, around the clock kind of a thing, and then they cut in between with some of the people talking. Um, I never, I never got any of that either. So I suppose I could go and hunt for it, but to be honest with you, Tommy, I don't, I'm not that interested. You know, I, I mean, I, I laughed at when we were when I was in Southampton, but with Daniel and stuff, I said, boy, this is really going to hurt. This, all this police brutality might really hurt the Tackleberry character a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to get rid of gun violence. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> so, oops, sorry, Dave. Uh-oh. You know who I might uh, have on the podcast soon is um, uh, Henriette Mandel. Oh, yeah, sure. Henriette, I don't think she remember me, but I remember her. Uh, yeah, she, she, she was great as Alice, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, she was just, oh, my God, she just reminded me of her in so many ways, especially yeah. the way she looked, you know. And, uh, yeah, I'd reached out to her, uh, like, several months ago, like, I think when the year started, and then she finally got back to me last week, and um, she told me that uh, she's in the middle of writing a book that she needs to finish. She says, I can, you know, we can talk after July 17th or whatever it was, and I was like, okay, great, and she's like, by the way, I love your your guest list. You have so many great people, especially people she knows, because she's a stand-up comedian, and I interview so many stand-up comedians, you know. Oh, that's nice. I thought that was cool, yeah. I mean, like, I... Where's she live now? Where is she? Where is she? I don't know. I'm going to find out, obviously, but I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, like I said, I've had so many great people. I mean, when the year first started, I had Marion Ross from Happy Days on. Oh, wow. She, oh, my God. Okay, so we, we talked for a half an hour, and then I had another interview about a half hour after that, and that went on for a very long time. And then almost two hours after we had talked, she called me back to tell me that I was a gentleman and that she had a great time talking to me. Nice. Yeah, yes. Everything I've heard from people that worked with her, and she is in LA. I saw her play once, and with friends that were in it, everybody consistently says she's just the nicest person. She's just so true, and kind. Mm-hmm. And that's really good to hear, you know. Yeah, I've had a couple people call me back before, but that one meant a lot to me. And my my parents. Yeah, I mean, they're they're proud of every interview I get, but that one, it, that that was it for them because you know, Happy Days was such a huge show. Right. It was huge. Right. And then you know, a month and a half or two later, I had James Drury, the Virginian, on, and he passed away two weeks later. Oh wow. Yeah, and the and the funny part about that is. Um, I was supposed to interview him the week before I actually did, and we got our time zones wrong, so I had to wait a week. 
and that was a good interview. I wish I hadn't uh, argued with him on this one little thing. I found out that he was right and I was wrong about uh, he'd worked with Sam Peckinpah on one of his earliest movies. I thought it was his first one, but it was actually his second one. Uh, and then um, last month I talked to uh, the great character actor Richard Hurd, and he passed away two weeks later. And yes, I, that's right. I saw that, too. I saw that in the paper, yeah. That was a crazy interview because I feel like he interviewed me more than I interviewed him. <laughs> he just was asking me. I was ready for everything, wasn't I? Yeah, he was asking me so many questions, you know. It was just, it was crazy. And there's so much stuff I didn't even get to, but it, it was great. It was great. And now I'm trying to get Burt Ward from Batman. Oh, wow. That would be awesome. Yeah. What have I heard about him? What's he do now? Is he like a cop or something? Or have I got, have I got my wrong? No, he uh, works with, uh, he works with um, animals. No, he works with animals. He's got this um, mm-hmm. this pet food company, and he does like adopt a dog thing, him and his wife. Oh, how nice. Yeah. And he just got a star on the Walk of Fame. Oh, he did? Wow. Yeah. Very good. Oh, I was so in love with him. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure there were a lot of gay guys in love with him, too. Now that I, I mean, in those days, I wouldn't have thought of that because I was young. But it's like, totally women and men and everybody in the whole world is in love with him. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm bi, but I, I didn't personally find him that attractive. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I hit the right age because he was like, you know, Davy Jones, you know, one of those kind of a nice. Oh, Davy, I liked, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of a fairly safe kind of young man, you know, but those days. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. what else, Tommy? What do you, what do you have anything interesting you want to ask me? Or, um, I mean, I already covered pretty much everything on planet Earth, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I mean, if you can talk about it, you know, you're, you're, you're the stuff that, uh, the kind of stuff that you're writing. Are you writing any autobiographical stuff? Well, almost all my stuff is originates sort of from something in my life, um, uh, what affects me, and that sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. When I came here, now I've been in, I moved on my birthday, so I know exactly the day I came here, which was in August, mm-hmm. and um, it's been almost a year now since I've written anything, basically. I mean, I. I've a little something, but I haven't. I, I, but, but, but I'm trying to give myself a break on that because, like, unlike a lot of people that, you know, are very disciplined and they say I have to write for five hours a day every single day, or I have to journal, blah blah blah. I've never had to do that. It's just sort of organically happened when it happened. And mm-hmm. I've written been so prolific since, since David died, and I started writing that I thought, you know, maybe this is just a natural break. You know, maybe I need to, you know, enrich myself again and. And discover new things and, you know, find something that excites me and interests me, you know. So I consider this part of the writing, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I play with it. I, I go a little mad sometimes. I go, why don't you just sit down and just start writing? But I said, because I don't know what I want to write. I don't have anything that's pressing on me right now. I do want to finish this one play, mm-hmm. but I haven't found how to finish it yet. So I just decided that, you know, just give yourself a little bit of a break here. And... You know, it's not like I'm not paying attention. You know, I've, I've relearned, I've learned so many new things. It's like I've learned a new language with the politics when all this started happening. And then I'm learning, you know, New York. And, and um, it's, like being, it's like being a traveler, you know. And people do that. And, I, you know, when I look at bios of, 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 art, of artists and especially writers that I admire, a lot of them take off periods of time. And I think, well, maybe that's just, I mean, it's scary for me because I've been doing it every single day, practically, and writing many, many plays and screenplays and everything for so long now. And now I'm not. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm not doing, I'm not doing jack shit. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I am, actually, because I'm learning New York. I'm learning what this is like. I'm watching the world happen and crazy things are happening. They're affecting me. I am becoming passionate about them. So maybe that's part of my, um, um, cycle, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't like to journal very much, and I remember a, 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 a teacher telling me that that's going to hurt my writing, and I don't agree with him. It, my writing has been absolutely, I think, very good and prolific and easy, easy to come by. I kind of channel something, you know, mm-hmm. and that channel ain't working right now. So it's like, okay. I mean, what's her name? Um, Elizabeth. I forgot her 
forgot her name now. You know, uh, Eat, Pray, Love and stuff. She has a book out called something like The Big Love or something. I did read it. Uh-huh. It was inspiration for writers. And she says, you know, if you're having one of these moments like I'm having, that nothing's really coming in. She says she gets all dressed up and does a dance and tries to get the muses to go, come here, come to me, come to me. Tell me what you want. Like, Let me be the vessel. And um, I haven't quite done that yet. <laughs> but I'm just getting close. And they have to do something with Seth Gilbert. Where is Gilbert? They have to do something as crazy as that. So I am not writing anything right now. I am just living and I'm learning. And, uh, but I, I really, I, I'm struggling with it because what I like to write a play. I like to write dialogue, and mm-hmm. I don't know. So I actually thought about writing a book in which I interspersed dialogue, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so tell about my life, but tell about it as a person who is a, is a playwright, mostly. Um, so something like that. Like I've been reading, I read a Nora Ephraim, and doing some Nora Ephraim writing. I don't necessarily love her that much, but just to get a sense of that kind of people that, that write differently. This, um, so I'm reading a lot. I'm reading Beth. I just read her book, and she does a little bit of that. She disperses it with emails from her grandma and stuff like that, and texts and stuff like that. And I thought, well, maybe I could intersperse mine with some of my writing from what I'm really good at, which is dialogue. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking of doing. Like I said, I had a play that was scheduled to go this summer in L.A. I was trying to figure out how I was going to do that financially, you know, go back and forth or stay there. Or, you know, you have to. The writer, playwright has to be there through the rehearsal mostly. It doesn't have to. She doesn't have to be. Yeah. But I know with my director would absolutely insist on it. So, um, you know, they have to be able to torture the playwright. You know, the actors <laughs> have to be able to torture the playwright or where is there fun in it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. I mean, it's just like you finally get to the end and you start the process and you get the, the smithereens by the writers, by the actors. Um you know, questioning every line you write. It's like, you know what, why don't you just pretend I'm dead, like Henry Henry Ibsen, and just figure out what I would say. You know, people study, what does he mean by this? What does he mean by that? But when you're a live playwright, they ask you that. It's none of your business. You figure out what it means to you. (laughs) You know, I don't have to answer every single line. Um, That's my personal process. You find your own process. So, Mm -hmm. but it can be rough. Um, so well, anyway, other than that, some sort, just think, Tommy, I don't know, but some sort that I'm supposed to be writing something like um, my own history of New York City in a weird way. You know, to be, um, I've just immigrated, the immigrated uh, I, I'm an immigrant now, and all these things happen that are historic and unbelievable, and I know there's going to be a lot of people writing about it, but... My own story is kind of weird, too, you know? I mean, I, I, nobody cares about me because I'm not famous, but um, <laughs> just to be able to, you know, you, you better love the process of the art you do because really, the, my writing is the thing that brought me the joy. Like I said, when you go get it put up on stage, generally that can be a very difficult time for a playwright. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, you get kind of get beat up. Um, um, so if I don't enjoy the actual process, so it's like, you know, you see, you die, and you wrote a book that maybe no one's ever going to read, but you wrote it. And, like, I, I, wrote, I did this one little children's book called Always My Dad, and I, I published it myself, and it won a gold, uh, Mom's Choice Gold Medal, like mm-hmm. I put that on it. Mm-hmm. It's a little teeny thing that <clears throat> someone will buy it buy that Facebook. But the truth is, it was joyous. I learned how to do that, and I did it. And having that done... Is a, is, a, is a big thing for me, even though, you know, nobody, you know, it's not going to win any, you know, it's not going to win a huge award or anything like that. It made, it made my life happy. So eventually I've got to figure out how to tell a story, um, you know, about being here. Or, you know, my, my friend has been telling me you're never going to really, get to, you, you have such a big story to tell with your life. Mm-hmm. And I'm, a, I'm an old <clears throat> ticket to, to tell that story still. So that's possible what I have to tell, you know, the ch- ch- my childhood on. Um, but I'm a little bit of a chicken, so I don't know. I don't know well, if I can do that. I'm going to read some memoirs and stuff like that. With, I don't want to hurt anybody, you know. I really I don't, I really want to be in this world. But, you know, Philip Roth had a, well, he quoted somebody else, but I only remember his quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it too, and he wrote, 
he said something to the effect of, if a family, if a, if a writer is born into a family, that family is doomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good and quote. It's so true. I mean, I have the power to crucify. Yeah. <laughs> You don't have to name names. You can make up names, you know? Yeah. You could just get it off your chest because you need to get it off your chest, you know? Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. And you can also do it in third person. It could be a story about a girl. Exactly. You don't have to say it's your own, you know? Yeah. What about that, too? Yeah. Exactly, you know? I mean, yeah. I have... No, so so of me. I'm telling you, I'm not proud of myself for this. I'm not proud of my being... I've always been a goody two-shoes chicken shit. Um... um <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but I don't know if I have. You know, it's like, how do you live with yourself every day? I always tell that to my kids, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, what matters is you can look in the mirror or you wake up every day without this feeling of regret or fear. Or, you know, you wake, it's how you, it's how you live with yourself. And so I want to find a way to, it's very important to me that I live without a burden, in a way, of being an asshole to somebody. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I'll figure, I'll figure it out somehow. But that's, those are the two things that are shaping me. Coming back here, and then also going back in time. So maybe I can find a way to connect them and all that, you know? Yeah. So it's, a, it's a big challenge. It's a challenge, and I'm, getting, I'm gearing up to be ready. Like today I sat at my desk and I went, you know, I could write from here. I can do this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think about it every single day, but just haven't done it yet. Yeah, I've been procrastinating, you know, screenplays I want to write, but I, I live in a, a home of insanity with my mother and my brother here, and there's just there's no there's no peace, you know, for me to write and stuff. Um, That's hard, isn't it? It's very hard, you know, especially you know, when they're struggling with with their own personal issues with stuff, you know. Yeah, um, but sure. I have I have sure stuff know. that I know it's going to be great, you know. But at a certain point, I will do it, you know. You know, I've had, I have one friend who's a very successful writer um, for, for a film, mostly. He's a writer-director. Mm -hmm. And he actually, I said to him, I said something about, you know, why am I moving? And I, you know, this and that. I do. He goes, you know what, I, he goes someplace every single time he goes somewhere to write a new story. Mm -hmm. He's married, he lives in L.A., but he goes to he, 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 Palm Springs or Mexico. He just places. And he goes and he writes there because he doesn't find it easy to write at home. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. And it also gives you inspiration, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I move around so much, you know? I don't know. Well, well, uh, David Lynch, he used to write at Bob's Big Boy um, out in L.A. Uh, he would go there like clockwork at 2.30 after the lunch rush every day, drink endless cups of coffee, and um, drink uh, thick uh, milkshakes, and it would give him creative inspiration to write. <laughs> well, there you go, you see? Yeah. People like that. Man that wrote that book, uh, Writing in Restaurants. He likes to go and write in restaurants. To me, I, I don't know how anybody could do that. I don't like to write longhand anyway. Me I, too. I, I would never be a writer if it wasn't a computer. I don't yeah. like writing. That's not my thing. Yeah, I hate it. I'm a lefty. And, and I've never a bad tendency of all the years, but mostly it just hurts my hands. I just, I just don't like it. So I hate writing cards. I hate doing things like that. But I do them. But I, I would never be a writer if I had to write longhand. J George. Not. My, my youngest, I, I found all this stuff when we were living in Connecticut. I just found these piles and piles of journals. And his hand, he's a lefty too, but he doesn't have that problem I do because he writes really small. He just, he packs all these pages in these journals, and I'm not the kind of mom that reads for kid stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I have friends that do that, but I've never, I have never spied on a kid. Um, yeah. I, of course, I was curious, because I'm sure that I was blasted a million times in those journals, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just amazing. I got all these things. I'm like, holy shit, what's this kid saying about me? Because I'm sure he's just mad at me throughout all of this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, George Lucas, he wrote Star Wars longhand in cursive. I don't think you could do that today. Oh, my God. No, nobody will. He could submit it, but I don't. He'd have to give it to a secretary, at least, to get, put, it, put it on, you know, final draft or whatever. 
yeah now but like then you know he he was nobody he just had american graffiti that was it and he could get away with that then yeah oh interesting god that's crazy yeah (laughs) so i think it's time to play my secret silly game kathy okay okay We, we didn't get to play this last time um it's silly slumber party questions and okay. <laughs> how this works. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Okay. And um, how it works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the same question and I answer it. Okay. Kathy, are you ticklish? Yes. Tommy, <laughs> are you ticklish? Yes, I'm very ticklish. <laughs> Um, is your belly button an any or an Audi? My belly button is an any. How about yours? It's also an any. Okay. <laughs> what color are your toenails painted? They are not painted now because of COVID. I just don't like doing my own toes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yours? Do you have your toenails painted? No, not at the moment. Last time I did, they were purple with sparkles. Yeah, I like to go elaborate. <laughs> what would you say? What would you say is your best personality trait? Um, hmm. I guess I'm, I I consider myself to be fairly tolerant of other people. Mm-hmm. How about you? How about you? My sense of empathy and the fact that I have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, I, I see it to an extent, you know, with the things yeah. things that you're passionate about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then my favorite... Yeah. yeah. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Yes, I hate the smell of dirty sponges. I hate sponges, basically, anyway. So I just put them in the dishwasher, like, every time. I barely ever use them. That's interesting. I hate sponges. They collect That's How about you? Um, either farts or feet. <laughs> well, I get that. <laughs> really, because whenever I tell someone uh, that, someone who has kids, it doesn't affect them. <laughs> yeah, I know when you when you when you raise, when you finish raising kids, you know you're so used to filthy diapers and all the ick that can happen that you kind of you know pretty much nothing phases me that way, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I have um, a couple jokes for you. Okay, good. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? No. A man will spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. (laughs) That's good. That's good. (laughs) I I told that to uh, Catherine Lee Scott from Dark Shadows. She did not like that joke. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then, um, you know why men like to marry virgins? Why? Because they can't stand criticism. <laughs> and I think that there's some truth in that one, for sure. <laughs> I think both of them have truth. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Kathy, oh, I thank you so much for coming back on. And, you know, you, you mentioned before, you're like, I'm not famous, nobody cares about me. No, I care about you because you are a gem of a lady. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, And thank you for, you know, I just love talking to you and I wish you so much, so much good stuff. I hope you get to go to Vegas. I hope that happens, huh? Oh, yeah. Um, Vegas. God, I want to, there's so many places I want to go to. You know, it's funny, you know, last, I was in LA last April. I talked to you last May. Uh, you moved to New York in August, and then I went back to L- L.A. in September. I was really going to hit you up and say, let's get lunch. <laughs> you know what? I remember you saying that. Isn't that funny? Just, we've two ships that passed in the night, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm in New York now, so you never know. Maybe you'll be out this way and we can get that lunch eventually. Yeah, by a miracle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, all right. 
right, Tommy. Let's do talking to you. Good luck with everything, all right? Oh, thank you. You too, yes. And uh, you're always welcome to talk again when the project, you know, comes to full wishes and all that. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. You have a great day. Thank you. You too, Tom. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Kathy Graff, Catherine Graff, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, God, I just love her. She is a gem of a lady, like I said, and a very talented writer. And let's see her dominate the world with her writings and her plays. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.